welcome Janine to the stage at this time. When I look out at you, I see diamonds. When I look out at you and then through you, into the districts that you represent, the teachers that you support, and the students that you serve, I see acres of diamonds. This reminds me of a story that now drives the work that I do. There was a man in, on the African continent, and he, he owned a farm and he would be working his farm and every now and then travelers would pass by and they would tell him of the wonderful diamond mines they would find and the millions that they made and about the second or third time he would hear this story he said you know what i'm done with my farm i'm going to sell my farm and i'm going to go out and find my treasure and that's just what he did he sold his farm for pennies on the dollar and then he went looking for his diamonds he went up high and low, east and west, near and far, until he just gave up because he found absolutely nothing and he passed away. Meanwhile, back at his farm, there was the new owner who was walking along the creek and he saw something glimmering off in the distance. He went to it and he picked it up and he didn't know what it was, a glass, something crystal-like, and he went home and put it on his mantle. About two weeks later, a friend came by, who happened to be a jeweler, and he said, what is that? And he went to it, he picked it up, and he realized that it was a diamond. And he asked him, like, where, did you, where did you get this? He was like, oh, I just went to my creek, because I'm on my property, there's a whole bunch just laying, they're not that big, but they're just there. And it turned out there was thousands of diamonds in this creek. The original farmer actually owned free and clear, acres of diamonds without even knowing about it. And so the logo of my company, which is this, is a diamond, and not just for the metaphorical reasons that, you know, the origin story of a, the heat and pressure or reminding us that we're all diamonds and we need to shine bright, but it reminds me to ask myself regularly and to ask you today, are you standing in acres of diamonds without even knowing it? We're here getting ideas, getting strategies, meeting pe people like, like Dr. Rick said, looking for new ways to serve our students. But have we looked where we actually are to see what's around us, our acres of diamonds? I actually am in an interesting position I started my teaching career as, or my career, as an ele elementary school teacher. I taught TK through fifth grade. Did, do I have any former elementary school te teachers here? Hey, right, the four, four formative years. And then I started a nonprofit for the graduates of my elementary school. So that's sixth grade through 12th grade. Do I have any former sixth grade through 12th grade educators here, right? And so we taught about creative literacy, financial literacy, and entrepreneurship. And then I was asked to teach at my local university where I live, Cal State University Northridge, for teaching master, um, students, teachers who were getting their masters at that time uh, with creative arts and, and creative integration. And then I was asked to join the board of Donor's, Donor's Shoes. Has anyone heard, heard of Donor's Shoes? And on the board, most powerful, one of the most powerful boards in the country, you have your CEO of Link, LinkedIn, your senior vice president of Facebook, the top woman investor in the nation, is all on this board. So in one week, I saw a four-year-old, right, for my teaching classes, all the way to a 64-year-old and everyone in between. Demographics, different educational levels, different financial and, and social economic statuses in one week, not over a career, in one week. So that put me in the position to ask, are we really giving our students the elements that they need to not just survive, but thrive in this new era that we're in? How do we allow them to shine in a workforce now that is filled with chaos, com confusion, and complexity? Words that we ignored 20 years ago, 15 years ago, words like emotional intelligence, adaptability, cultural competence, which we'll be talking about today, 
Psychological safety, that word just popped up in the past two years, right? And a word that I'm introducing to you today that I hope you'll take with you, the term intercultural creativity. What is intercultural creativity? Now, being an educator, I, you know I have to be clear with my definitions, because if I say a term, it can mean something totally different to you than to me, depending on our experiences, correct? And so I'm gonna go over intercultural creativity. It's the combination of cultural competence and creative thinking. Cultural competence. Who knows a person in your life that no matter where they go, they can connect with anyone they, they meet? Do you have that, that friend, right? So in, no, no matter what type of culture, wherever country, city, they can make that connection. That's an example of cultural competence. That those people, they're highly observant of similarities and, and differences, and they're able to observe with complexity, they're able to perspective shift and adapt their behavior accordingly. Those are highly cultural, culturally competent people. Dr. Milton Bennett, who introduced this term a few decades ago, he was wondering why some people are really good at this and other people just, like, it's just their perspective. If you have a different lived experience, they don't wanna really connect, like, or they have trouble connecting. Why are some people really good at this and some people aren't? And so that's what his work fo focused on. And so he showed how you can develop your cultural competency. There's some people with monocultural mindsets, meaning they're just really kind of into the way they do, do things and not really exploring other types of lived experiences, all the way to an intercultural mindset. That's your example of that friend you have that no matter where they go and where they are, they can make connections. And the one thing that he made sure you want to be aware of, cultural competence requires self-awareness, other awareness, and situational awareness. So that's intercultural creativity, someone who has this type of awareness. But if you look at the top one, it starts with yourself. And so that's the cultural competence aspect of intercultural creativity. Let's look at what creative thinking is. Definition-wise, we have a, like, I feel like we have a third of the population that thinks creativity is only artistry. So they're saying, oh, I can't sing like Whitney Houston, I can't dance like Justin Timberlake, so I'm not creative. And they're saying this out loud so their subconscious brain is hearing I'm not creative, so what happens? The brain shuts down and doesn't create. And so I am proposing a new definition for you to take back with you that I hope you'll agree with me on. I'm saying that creative thinking is the process of problem finding and problem solving with relevance, value, and novelty. People who are highly creative aren't just waiting for things to fall in their lap. They're out there being curious, they're observant, they're asking questions, well, why is it this way? Well, why don't we do it that way? And creative thinking sits on different cognitive processes such as divergent thinking. Not just convergent thinking, there's only one right answer, but divergent thinking. Let's look at different possibilities. Creative thinking also sits on reframing sits on combinatory thinking, right? Albert Einstein said, innovation is the essence of combinatory thought. It also sits on unusual associations. I just posted on my, link, my LinkedIn about what, what do Abraham Lincoln, the Titanic, and Jackie Robinson, the baseball player, have in common. If you wanna check out the answers, go find my LinkedIn response. But unusual some associations, highly creative pe people can do that. And metaphorical thinking. And here's why RTM brought me in today. Because the World Economic Forum said creative thinking is now the number one skill needed in the workforce. Now, I didn't say it, RTM didn't say it, the World Economic Forum said it. So if that's true for the workforce, guess what K-12 needs to be more cog cognizant of? Are we integrating this into our career curriculum? So this is creative thinking. And intercultural creativity is the combination of it both because I was, Doing the research, and I looked that when you juxtapose them together, they sit on the same cognitive skills, which my, my research has labeled it the seven gems, because we're all about the diamonds, right? Who doesn't like a good eth 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 ethically mine diamond? But um, they sit on the same skills that we call the seven gems of intercultural creativity. And what we know is we have to start paying attention to how these skills are connected to the brain. 
Now, I have my background in psychology, education, and human development, but I say I have a street degree in neuroscience because even when I was at UCLA in the late 90s, when fMRI machines first were coming on the scene in the 90s, I was with my professors. Just I can't tell you how many times I've been in an MRI. My mom was like, stop doing those, those tests with them. You don't know what they're doing to your brain. I was like, I'm learning. And so I did a lot of research with them at UCLA. But now, 20 years later, I'm on the other side looking at how do we take these findings and attribute them to the classroom and the workforce? What does that mean? What's going on underneath the hood? Because now we can see creativity. We can see where it is and how it lights up. We can see how culturally responsive classrooms, right? And how emotion connects to learning because of the brain. And we can see that what goes on in the brain is built by experiences that happen in a child's life. What does that mean for us to, today? And it's causing us to ask the question, how can insights in brain processes enhance education for the whole child? I looked at your itinerary, there's some sessions going on about the whole child. Are you considering the neural life of that child as well? So we know that learning is cultural. We know that learning is emotional and learning can give you a brain freeze as well that can motivate you. Quick story, I have, um, I'm friends with a, a sixth grade math teacher and she was telling me a story about how she was teaching per percentages and ratios. And there was a student in the back of the classroom who was you know, not too engaged, kind of slouching, whatever. And as she's doing her lesson, he suddenly says, wait, what? And everyone turns and looks at him because he doesn't really speak too much during class. And he says, wait, I buy a Slurpee for 99 cents and I give the man $1.50 and he just looks at me, so I just leave. But what you're saying is I should have gotten change back? And so of course, a good teacher does this, right? And I'm pretty sure all of you would do this. So you grab onto that teachable moment, right? And you say, okay class, how much should he be paying for the, slurp, the, the Slurpee? How much money is he getting ripped off, right? Because a, a student was like, dude, you're getting ripped off. And then if he bought a Slurpee every day for a whole school year for 40 weeks, how much is he totally getting, getting ripped off? And if you put that into a growth stock mutual fund for 20 years at 20%, what does that look like too, right? Financial lit a li a literacy, right? I'm really big on financial literacy as well. And so we know that a motivation is connected to emotion. Emotion and the word motivation come from the same Latin word, mover, to move. And so if we wanna move our students to learn, we have to be aware of this. Albert Einstein says, you can't force a child to learn. All you can do is create the environment where they can and they're motivated to learn. And so that's what the seven gems of intercultural creativity are about. How do we as educators and as leaders create environments where our students are intrinsically motivated to learn? So are you ready? Oh, come on. Oh. I'm, like I said, I, I'm an elementary school teacher by trade, so you know, like, don't, don't make me pull out my uh, tricks, right? Are you ready? Okay, awesome. All right, so the first, and you have some of these, um, they're on your table as well if you want to follow along. We, we can share, right? Share, pair, pair and share. The first, yeah, I'm, I'm going to bring you back to your, to your teacher ed program days. Um, the first gem is creative growth mindset. Based off the wor work of Carol Dweck, growth and fixed mindset. For those of you who may not be familiar with her work, she talks about fixed mindsets, where people even think, people usually think that either you have it or you don't. You're smart or, or you're not, you get it or, or you don't. All the way, and it's a continuum, to growth mindsets. You know, I may not be good at it now, but if I work, I can get better. And so this is based off of that work because cultural competence and creative thinking, intercultural creativity is a growth mindset journey you can get better at it. You can improve your cultural competence. You can improve your creative thinking. It's not a either or. And so one thing that we need to know is that it's a choice. You chose to be here today. Cultural competence is a choice as well. You have to, you and your teachers, your, your leaders, you have to choose to reach out and get to know your students who may be coming from a different lived experience, right? You have to choose to be a part of these courageous conversations we're having, we're having 
around diversity, equity, and inclusion, and, and our students actually seeing themselves within your curriculum. That, that's a conversation that people are choosing to have, and you have to choose to invest the time to look at the curriculum and see where there's cultural connections are. That's an investment of time, and you have to choose that in the same vein, creative thinking is a choice as well. You have to choose to have unconventional thinking, especially as technology ramps up and changes the way that we're teaching our students. You have to choose to reframe problems and situations, and we have to choose to say, the status quo may not be the best for us. What are some new ways? Where do we get these new ideas? Creative thinking is, is a choice. And the work of Carol Dweck, some, some mind-blowing work. And every time I say the research shows, I'm not just saying that. If you need to email me and say, Janine, I like that point, please send me the research, I will, because everything is backed up. The mindset research from Carol Dweck shows that the mindset, the creative growth mindset of your superintendent, your principals, your teachers, highly affect those in their charge. So we're, we're all focused on the curriculum, and we, in my teacher ed program, I never did any mindset awareness type of assessment or anything, I had no clue. They said that is a huge influence. Carol Dweck shares um, uh, data that students, primarily students from marginalized groups who are in growth mindset classrooms, outperform students who were in fixed mindset classrooms, meaning the teacher had a fixed mind mindset. And this really showed true for students from, from marginalized groups and students of color. So do your teachers have even an awareness of where they are on that continuum? Mindset affects performance. And please email me if you want that, that da data. And so one way that we can help our teachers and our, prin our principals be aware of their mindset if they're, especially if they're in the growth mindset and allow the people under them to grow that as well, is be transparent with your journey. This is me in front of my actual students preparing for a TEDx talk. And I said, I, I'm scared, this is a big stage. TEDx, is, that's a big, big stage. And they knew I, I had speech issues, I was nervous, I normally speak in front of kids, I don't speak in front of adults, you guys are scary, you know? And I shared that with them. So share your journey, share the risk that you're taking, share that you're scared but you're still doing it anyway and show them that the land of amazing, you gotta go through not yet amazing to get there. They need to see that in order to be, be that. And so when you have that mindset, that means you are ready for whatever comes your way. And that leads us to our next gem. I should have you call out. Call out, what's our next gem? The empathetic way, try it again. All right, I'm gonna have you guys all singing in C, C major by the time we're, we're done, right? Because um, I did teach mu music as well. The empathetic way. And so this is a word that's coming up. There's a lot of sessions about um, SEL and, and, and all, of, all of their, this good stuff. Does anyone know who, who this is? Call out. Adele, and I like bringing current re resources, current and historical um, examples into my work. Last week or a week or two ago, she gave a performance, a private performance where people were allowed to ask her her questions. And someone stood up and said, who was an inspirational force in your life during your, your childhood years? And before the woman even got the question out, Adele said, oh, Miss Mc McDonald. And then she gave her her response and she said something that stuck with me that I want to share with you. She said, she really made us care about the content because we knew she cared. Look at Adele's face. She hasn't seen that woman in over 20 years. Look at her face. This shows you that learning embedded with positive emotional cues, it sticks. That's what the brain research Show, shows you. And so emotion leads, content follows. Right? Emotion leads, content fo follows. Connection leads, content follows. So what's leading in your schools? I'm gonna let that sit for a second, right? What's leading in your, your schools? And so 
we know that empathy and creativity are important, but they need experiences to bring them up. The number one indicator of a highly creative person is openness to experience. The number one indicator of a highly culturally competent person is openness to people with different lived experiences. And so as an educator, if I'm working on my cultural competence, I'm automatically increasing my creative thinking, one with the other. And that's what my work focuses, focuses on. But there's always a caveat. There's always that, that, that enemy. Does anyone have a brain in here? You're, all your hands should beat up or you wouldn't be alive, right? Well, I have two, right? And I, I travel with, with her too. Um, this is gonna be your best friend or your worst enemy, okay? So uh, the brain, if we are dealing with unconscious bias, or implicit bias, that's a force we gotta reckon with. Because unconscious bias, it limits our worldview, which attacks our creativity, and it also limits our view of the people we're with, our colleagues, our students, which attacks our cultural comp competence. And so that's why it's so important for us to do unconscious bias training and to become aware and then have action steps to, to monitor and manage unconscious bias. I have a friend who's a top unconscious bias trainer, and he says, if you have a brain, you have a bias. I don't care what demographic you are, I don't care what your life experience is, we all have biases, get used to it. Now, some people deal with them and other people ignore, ignore them. That's where the difference lies. But we all have bias. And so for an educator to stand in front of students and not have even thought of any of my biases, there's where the is issue is. And so we need to be mindful of that because they can prevent our own creative potential and the way we see the creative potential of others as well. So managing and controlling for biases is a big need and a big professional development that we really wanna start paying attention to. And so now that we have our mindset in place and that we're working on our empathy and connection, now we can observe what's actually going on around us. Observation, cultural observation. I see you, I see me. Does anyone recognize this? What do you see? All right, yeah, what do you think about, right? All the associations, right? Well, I had a friend who said, you know, Janine, for the longest time, I thought Colonel Sanders, Colonel Sanders' head, Colonel Sanders' head, was on, was on top of his body. I thought his bow tie was his body. I was like, really? <laughs> you know, were you, were you trying not to laugh? But like, okay, are you serious? But then the educator, right, the researcher in me was like, that's interesting because that shows me that exposure affects observation. You and I could be looking at the same exact thing and have two completely different reactions to it. And so if we're not culturally competent and connecting with our students and connecting with our teachers and the people we work with, our, our secretaries, our anyone we work with, we don't we won't know what they've been exposed to and we don't want we don't know how they're interacting with the content or whatever the task is at hand another thing that showed me is culture affects observation whether this be ethnic culture national culture and by the way when i say culture i don't just mean ethnic ethnicity and nationality a culture is a group of pe people with the same values beliefs and systems you can have a soccer mom culture or a tech co culture right? Your schools have a culture there, right? And so that affects observation. Erin Meyer, who is an intercultural consultant, she has a book called The Culture Map. And they talk about a study in that book that says they had a group of people look at an aquarium. And they realized that people from Western countries mostly focused on what was in the forefront and people from Eastern cultures mostly focus what was in the background, the background details. And so what that shows is that where you grew up, what culture you came up in, affects what you see. How you are trained to see, right? Because we're training our kids to see different ways. It affects that way. So how do we open that up and allow our kids to have 
more different perspectives of seeing. Because, and this is another reason why DEI work is so important. Because if you have everyone on your team that has the same experience as you, that looks like you exactly, same demographics, psychographics, and experiences, yes, you're all getting along very well, but you're all seeing the same things, but you're also missing the same things. And so having a diverse, cognitive diversity, not, not just demographical diversity, cognitive diversity, they think differently, they come to conclusions differently, because we want to make sure there's details that we are not missing because you want to be mindful of the details that get missed. Correct? You see, we missed this one. There he's not, but there he is. Did anyone see him at the bottom? All right, so we want to make sure that there's details that we're not, not, not miss, missing. And so that's why we need to have a diverse group. And so to observe, because we're in our gym, cultural observation, the word observe, I'm really big into etymology if you haven't figured that out by now because words tell you a story and where they come from tell you a story. And so the word observe actually means from the Latin to attend to. What are you paying attention to? And it doesn't just mean see. A lot of people see the word observe and they just mean, oh, I see something. It's activating all of your physical senses, your intuition sense, your emotional sense, your creative sense, your spiritual sense. And also training our students to interact with their senses as well. But as an educator, what am I paying attention to? Am I actually listening to my students? Do I just hear them or am I listening to what they're saying and what they're not saying, right? There's information in the, ab the absence. And so when we observe, we want to really heighten up our ability to to, to listen well and to see well, to be a, sensitive to patterns, right? People communicate through, through different, different forms. And so teachers who increase their observational awareness also increase their observational complexity. And that's within the definition of cultural competence. People who have observational complexity and they're able to per perfect a shift and adapt their behaviors in different cultural situations. How do we bring this up? for our teachers, especially in times like these. So being aware of what we pay attention to because we don't want to miss the moments. In, one, in my, my class, as I, I mentioned, I was on the, on the board of directors of Donors Choose and now I'm on their advisory board. And during 2015, they were having an anniversary, right? They were 15 years old and I said, okay guys and girls, I want to make sure that, our, that we celebrate Donors Choose. And because I was able to get instruments in my classroom and books, and they've been just a huge, huge benefit for my class. So let's celebrate them. So I went and got a cake. And I came back to the class classroom and we, we decorated the cake and I'm just struggling trying to say, you know, happy birthday, donors choose. And a student walks up to me and says, Miss, Miss Leffert, I, I can actually help you with that. I go to cake class. And I'm like, cake class? You go to cake class? Now, I worked in Canoga Park, which is a little bit north of Los An Angeles, and most of my students are uh, free, free lunch. We all qualify for free, free lunch, and, and those demographics were in place. So cake class was not the first activity that I would have pinned for my students. But at that moment, I suddenly became the learner, and she became the master. Because I realized I did not even, I wasn't even aware of something we call cultural capital cultural capital. And what we know, the neuroscience is showing us, is that we need to start being mindful of leaning more towards acid-based learning and strength-based learning. There's research out there that shows that successful people, not, not just financially or professionally, but successful people mentally, emotionally, people who have an idea of their life's purpose, they were reflective and knew how to bring into the market their strengths. That's a skill. They worked on looking at their strengths, knowing what their strengths were and bringing them into the market. But here's the kicker. As an educator, if we want to focus on bringing that up, if I want to create a classroom where my students are reflective upon their strengths, 
I have to make sure I'm doing the work on my cultural lenses and my bias that could prevent me from seeing what a student's strengths actually are. That's, that's going to be big because we all have lenses going on. We're all coming into the classroom with cultural cap capital. And so what we really need to understand is we can start the conversation with our students and with our teachers and with whoever who we're working with by asking them, where do you shine, right? To use my metaphor of the diamond, you can use your, your own phrase. Where, where, do you, where do you feel that you are able to contribute? Or how can we give you experiences to see more where you're strong? Where do you shine? Because our children are coming to us with funds of knowledge, with cultural capital, and with assets of potential. And it's our job, our purpose, to observe, right? We're in the observational gem right now, to observe what those could be. Our students are not blank slates. They're coming to us with so much. But are we missing the moments? Are we missing the details because of our observation. And so I'm all about strategies and tips. You're going to get a lot of strategies and tips during your three days here. I know it. One way that you can start today, I should, I should have spoke to Sarah, like we should have a karaoke night, right? Because one way you can increase your observation is through the arts. Now I did teach music, so I could be a little biased there, but I do have the research to back this up. The arts are a great way to increase your observational skills for creativity and cultural competence. And we know this now because of brain research and just because we know the arts are important, just because you're human. And so there is a great book that I love called Originals, How Nonconformists Move the World by Adam Grant. He's an organizational psychologist. And he talked about, or he talked about a research study that looked at all of the Nobel Prize winners from 1901 to 2005. And they saw that a majority of them, over 80% of them, had a background in the arts. Now don't worry, I'm not gonna make you get up and dance, you know, even though we, we could. But this is not coincidence. He said that people who are open to new ideas in business and in science and entrepreneurship, they're also fascinated with expression of those ideas and emotion through images, sounds and words. And so I, I know you guys are dealing with a lot of things that I'm not even aware of, like budgets and everything. But when we take away the arts from our kids, we're not just taking away like, extracurricular activities. Woo! We're actually taking away intense training. The brain is having a great time. There's a great TEDx video called, um, or TEDx lesson video called Music in the Brain. I highly suggest you watch it. But yes, your brain neurons are going off when they're in arts, class, theater, music, drama, and dance. But the brain is going through intense training of emotional intelligence. The brain is going through intense training of multi-sensory activation and intuition engagement and translation of ideas. All of these areas deal with creative thinking and cultural competence. And so if you look at some of your major players today, a lot of them have an arts background, and we haven't really made that association. But I'm glad you're here, so when you go back, you can look at that music teacher and know that they're, this is what they're, they're doing. You can look at that drama and dance teacher and tell them this is actually what's going on. And so when you're observant, you're able to be in wonder about your observation, which leads us to our next gem is Oh, I, I should be giving out our pens, right? Right, and I feel like Oprah, you get a gem, you get a gem, you, you get a gem. All right, so cultural curiosity. Who is the leader of curiosity? Does anyone know? Thank you, thank you. I, I will take that. You see me after class, sir. All right. Kindergartners love this character. Curious George, the curious little monkey. Curious George, who knew this little monkey that a lot of your kindergartners do watch, who was into everything, who was annoying the man in the yellow hat, had the one trait that CEOs need, superintendents need, your leadership, your C-suite needs in order to keep their organizations afloat. 
curiosity, curiosity. And if creativity drives innovation, curiosity drives creativity. If you don't believe me, the doctor is in. I have a podcast called Create and Grow. It's um, formerly Create and Grow, Grow Rich, but we're just creating and growing now. And I have on my podcast, um, what episode is this? Ep episode 74. If you really want to hear some, some folks talk, check out this work. Dr. Ellison Hoistmeister out of USC, she got her doctorate in workplace curiosity. Who gets their doctorate in curiosity? She does. And so she said, Janine, the curiosity level of your CEOs, your superintendents, and your leadership is directly correlated with the strategic orientation and the survival of that organization because it shows their ability to explore and to access the, access the resources they have with them, but also their ability to see down the road, to forethink and to see what is right around the corner. That was huge. And so she really goes in deep. I, I really think you should check out that episode about how curiosity is gonna be a topic that you're gonna be hearing a lot um, about. And the thing is, no one has to teach us how to be curious when we come to this earth. If any of you have children or you have seen a child from afar, you know they come to the earth highly curious. But because of systems of conformity, systems of limitation, of don't do that, don't do that, it gets dulled and it gets shut down. And so what is curiosity actually? Curiosity is that internal motivation plus emotion that drives learning and discovery. You can't talk about learning if you're not talking about curiosity. And so if it does get shut down in childhood, guess what? You have adults who are not curious. And that's what our workforce is dealing with because now we have to figure out how do we redevelop this skill that we all came to the earth with. So how do we redevelop it for, for teachers and how do we protect it in our students? That is the question. And one of the ways is to know what it is, know how to cultivate it, and know what are things that can detract from it. And so Dr. Allison Hoistmeyer, she talks about four inhibitors to curiosity, one of them being top-down decision-making. Are only your decisions coming from the top or do people from other levels have an opportunity to share ideas? Is it more than just saying, my door is open, or do you actually have routes for ideas to get to the superintendent? You guys are hard to get to. Can your people get to, to, to you? I have stories that I do not have time to share of the best ideas coming from the security guard. Your best ideas are in your cafeteria right now. That can totally shift your entire dis district. Can they get these ideas to, to you? Another thing that Dr. Al Allison shared was preference of the status quo. You know, what is that? Um, that, that, that Newton's law, right? An object in motion stays in motion. It's sometimes hard to go against things that are already going a di direction. So if you have an idea that may go the opposite direction, you might get, get shunned out. And a lack of creative thinking time. If you listen to um, one of the podcasts that I'll talk about a little bit late, later, we talk about the different networks in the brain. There's a focus network, and then there's something called the innovation network meaning it's your imagination time. If you see someone's kind of staring off into space, thinking about stuff, their innovation network is turned, turned on. You have to give people time to sit and think and to have that rest time for their innovation network to turn on. If people don't have creative thinking time, your creative ideas will not surface and get from the subconscious into to the conscious to you. And then we have the fear of being ostracized. Creativity, creative ideas, it's lonely at the t up, up here. Trust me, with intercultural creativity, people are like, what? I haven't heard, heard of that, what? Right? So do your people have opportunity to share their ideas without being ostracized from of, uh, others? So be, being aware of, of these leads us to creating psychologically safe environments. This increases curiosity. So having people be aware of those aspects is it's key. And if you have those in place, now you're able to allow people to perspective shift around what they're curious about. This is Clint. Has any, anyone heard of, of Clint? Wonderful one, but 
after today, all of you. Clint was an elementary school student who would just be tapping, tapping, tapping. And his teacher would be like, Clint! And the student would be like, oh my goodness, you know? And he just couldn't help it. He was just tap tapping and just tapping. And sometimes he would do it without even knowing. And one teacher sent him to the principal's office and the principal's like, okay, well, just try to sit on your hands, you know? And he would go back and get in trouble again. And then he went into a fifth grade, his fifth grade classroom. And then he just kept tapping. And the teacher said, Clint, I'll see you after class. And the students left and Clint just knew he was in trouble. And the teacher, Mr. Jensen, walked up to him and said, don't worry, you're, you're not in trouble. But I think, I think you're a drummer. Have you ever thought about taking drum lessons? And he reached into his desk and he gave Clint his first pair of drumsticks. Now Clint travels around the world drumming for the top bands and he speaks to students. You can look him up and bring him to some of your, your schools. He speaks to students about finding their strengths. And the reason why I love this story is because I'm going to be honest with you, as an educator, I would be like, Clint, stop tapping, right? It just, it just, yeah. But Mr. Jensen said, wait, wait, wait. He's not trying to be disruptive on purpose. There's something else going on at, at play here. So he was curious and he was observant. These other gems were in place in Mr. Mr. Jen Jensen. And so he said, maybe I can shift my perspective around what's going on and see what, the, what another cause of this could be. And ended up changing this young boy's life dramatically. And so do we see our students in different perspectives? Do we see our teachers in different perspectives as well? Are we able to pull out those strengths? Something that can be construed as a negative, now a positive and life-changing for this board just because this man took a moment to be curious about an, an, another way of seeing the behavior, right? And so are we, could we be a Mr. Jensen? Another great guest on my podcast is Dr. Michael Platt. He's one of the top neuroscientists in the nation out of the Wharton School of Business. And he said, Janine, leaders need to know how to perspective shift because you're missing key information if you can't shift perspectives and take the perspective of, of, of others. And he said, perspective shifting, when you know how to do it and, and you redevelop the skill, it increases your social brain. And this is episode 66. And he talks about how people who perspective shift grow in empathy and connection, which is cultural competence, and they look at problems and possible solutions and situations from various perspectives, which is creative thinking. So perspective taking hits both of those at the same time. This is a great book, by the way. I, if I had my say, I would make every educator read this book. It's short, it's like a fast read, but it will change the way you look at people and what's going on under the hood if you are a leader. I feel like I should get royalties from this book because I tell everyone to read this book. I should talk, uh, talk, talk to him ab about that. Anyway, um, so when you increase your perspective, you increase your vantage points. And don't we want to give our students and our teachers the advantage, right? Especially in this, in this environment that we're now on. In order to increase your advantage, increase your vantage points. When you're able to do that, you are able to adapt. You're able to adapt authentically adapt, which is our next gem. Another great example that I have for this gem, I like to bring my gems to life with examples, is this person. Has anyone heard of George Washington Carver? Now, what is he known for? Peanuts, right? <laughs> peanuts, peanuts. He's known for peanuts. Like, oh, he's the inventor of peanuts, right? Well, let, let me just blow your mind because he is known for, well, he has done so much more even though we just kind of little him down to just, oh, he invented things with, with peanuts. George Washington Carver was born in slavery um, in 1865, so right on, on the tail end, and he was very frail. He was left, left to die in the woods, um, but he was um, brought back, back to health in the woods, connecting to nature, and he was very observant. What people don't know is he was a painter. He started painting what he, see, what, what he saw. He has won international painting awards international, not national, international painting awards from his paintings. And then he became a musician. Now, 
Now he's sensitive to pitch and ca cadence. And what people don't know is, as he became a botanist, right? The art, the, the painting helped him see what others didn't see about plants and flowers and cultivating the land. And he would work with formerly enslaved men and women and taught them how to cultivate the land. What a lot of people don't know is he also got called in to the White House to work with the Roosevelts. And Gandhi called him to help him with his diet. And the Russians called him to, to help lead. I don't know about you, but I want students like that. I want students who can work with anyone at any time. That is intercultural creativity. We know he was creative. He has tens of, I don't even know how many patents to his name. But he was interculturally creative. He could sit with Theodore Roosevelt and sit with a person who just got their free freedom and treat them exactly the, the same or, or, or adapt his ability to connect with them. That is a skill that we want our students to enter the workforce with. And so George Washington Carver, who is the first um, non-president to have a monument named after him, by the way, there's a great short book on Amazon about his life. I highly recommend it as well. But he knew how to be interculturally creative. And he was in a VUCA in environment, especially as a formerly enslaved person, right? VUCA is a term that's used by the military that the business world has hijacked. And I think the education world is starting to use it every now and then too. VUCA stands for V. Okay, this is the teacher coming out. V. U. C. And A. Who feels they're in a VUCA environment right now? Some, some of, well, your, your, your students are entering into a VUCA environment because the rules are changing. The rules about education and then college and then having the same job for the next 40 years, that, that is, is changing under our feet right now. So our students need to know how to navigate a VUCA environment and how to be sensitive to pattern shiftings and things along those, those lines. So when you have these gyms in place and when you're able to adapt, you're ready to be a bridge. And this is our final gem, something I'm calling being a bridge, creating across cultures. If you're in war, like the old time war, like the, like the Civil War, what's the first thing that they did? Do I have any Civil War folks in here? Because I'm, I'm big on sense of war and like Abraham Lincoln and everything. The first thing they, they did was you take out their bridges, right? You take out their bridges, you take out their ports, you take out their points of entry because that's where resources flow. Now, in intercultural creativity, we don't want to destroy bridges. We want to be a bridge. We want to be connectors of resources. We want to be connectors of innovation. And for this to happen, we need to be mindful of the bridging that's happening under the hood. Brian Brower, who um, talks about the brain and cultural connections, he says that the, the Office of Neuroscience the laboratory of the neuroscientists and your classrooms are a bridge too far. We're too far. We need to start connecting. We need to start talking. So educators and principals and superintendents can know what's going on in your students' brains and how to really tap into that. And so we need to be bridges of neural connections. And the way we do that is we create these cultural connections, which means we're observant of our students. We know them. We see them. We're curious. We're curious about them. Dr. Kenneth West, Weston, Dr. Kenneth Wesson, who is a neuroscientist, and, things, and I need some more women neuroscientists. I need, I need, need to find them, because I have all these men. It's like, where are my women neuroscientists? So um, if you know Benny, please do an in introduction. Um, but Dr. Kenneth Weston, he talks about how assets and de deficits are reflections of neurological investments. And so if we want to help our students succeed in certain areas, we need to be mindful of those, those ties, those neurological in investments that they may be lack lacking. He also says that we don't just shove new, new information in, into kids. The brain doesn't operate that way. The brain operates by taking new information and integrating it with learned in in information. In order for you to have a great integration, you have to know who you're integrating to. We have to make those cultural 
couldn't connect you. And so understanding that we can be bridges for our students and we can create bridges within our students neurologically, that is a key step and the, the gym help us do that. So in order to be a good bridge builder, we have to make sure these other gems are in place. Mindset is there. We know that we can grow in cultural competence and creativity. We're open-minded, we're empathetic, we're observant, we're curious, we're able to take perspectives of the people we're working with, and we're able to adapt. That's how we can be bridge builders. My third grade teacher would be very surprised to see this photo because she had to send me to speech therapy three times a week. There were times I couldn't even say my own name without stuttering. And I still stutter today as an adult. If, you, if you're a speech therapist, you might have caught it every now and then. And I thought my ideas were worthless only because I couldn't communicate them fluently. And getting from the speech therapy room to that stage has been a hard journey, lots of work. But it happened because she saw diamonds within me and where I saw broken glass. But she was a pivotal force because she took the time to see me, to hear me, to listen. She was curious. And she knew how to take my, my perspective and to, to relate. And I had teachers along the way that did the same as well. And so just like Clint is traveling around the world doing all that and, and Adele is giving their creative gifts and not create, don't forget creativity isn't only art, artistry, giving their creative gifts in business and, and, and psychology and all the other fields in education like I, I am. It came from the gems that my educators held and my mother held. And so in the end, intercultural creativity is our goal. Yes, we have math standards and ELA standards and you have your ESL levels and we have IEP plans. Trust me, I had mine. That's not our goal. Those are means to an end, correct? Our goal is producing students who are interculturally creative. No matter where they land, no matter where life puts them, they're able to work with anyone and they're able to create with anyone and everyone. They're able to produce value. Cultural competence is needed for your DEI goals and for inclusion. Creativity is needed to produce value. Those are the type of students that we want to give to the world. These are the type of students that are coming up under your direction. And so intercultural creativity is our goal. And RTM brought me here to remind you that you are actually surrounded by diamonds. You're surrounded by diamonds. And they're here giving you the best strategies and the best tools and tips and mind to help us better buff and cultivate and cut these diamonds so that they can shine bright. Because that's why we're here, to shine bright. Thank you. Thank you, Janine. And uh, that's kind of neat walking in the field of diamonds. That's pretty cool. <laughs> and we all we all have diamonds in our district, and I think you gave us a whole new perspective on how to see them. So thank you very much for providing those words of wisdom and those challenges for us as superintendents. I'm going to ask uh, if you would just stay in your seat for just a minute. And I know Janine's going to be in the lobby, yes. right? Mm -hmm. And um, in just a few minutes when we go on break, I'm going to ask that you visit her table and. Uh, She's going to have some books there. Be willing to sign them for you. And, yeah, and, and one, one book is a children's book that shows you how the creative thinking happens, but in children's book style, and the other book is the adult book. Very good. Thank you, Janine. Thank you. Let's give a round of applause again. Thank please. you.